All right, everybody. So I've now started the recording. Good morning to everyone or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Today is Wednesday, November the 1st. And my name is Matt Burgess. I'm from the University of Virginia. And along with Neil Caden and Tricia Gordon, I am one of the facilitators of these Aperio teaching and learning meetings. So we're so glad to have you all here for our main presentation from Sam Lee Pan and Alistair Hendricks on mobile apps in Sakai. This is gonna be a really, really great presentation and we're so grateful to them for making time in their afternoon in South Africa to share their work with us. So before we dive into that, we always take a few minutes to talk a little bit about some announcements from the community. So if anybody has reports or announcements about various events going on in the community, now is the time to come on the mic or come on the chat and share those with us. So take it away. Well, uh, I guess that, that would be a cue, cue for me. Uh, hey, Tog, the mic though, let's see if anyone else wants to make announcements first. And by the way, can we please um, have a link to the etherpad? I think I can find it here. Oh, there we go, thanks, thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, my name up there. Uh, yes, this is Neil, uh, Sakai Community Coordinator, and there are a lot of announcements. Um, I'll be brief. Um, I see a request to hear about Sakai Minicamp. I don't really have anything prepared to talk about about it, but that's a good question. Uh, we did one of the pieces, which is recorded, and if you want a copy, we can get you a copy of it, is um, discussion on the NGDLE, the Next Generation Digital Learning Environment. There's some ongoing discussions. There's a small group planning group uh, to uh, push those discussions forward, uh, including a presentation at the Sakai Virtual Conference and beyond that. Um, so that was one of the highlights. It was a, it was a, a lot of fun. We had representation from, uh, of course, Duke University, where it was hosted, uh, Wake Forest University, um, and UNC Chapel Hill, and Durham Tech, and Dr. Chuck was there. And uh, so we just had some, you know, shared information about what the different universities are doing and where they're at. And then we had some discussions around things like NGDLE. Um, and we also had a SUGI presentation, which was really, really nice. And some discussion around SUGI, uh, that, which is another Aperio project. Um, so other things that are going on. Uh, the move to Atlassian uh, Jira Cloud has been canceled or postponed. Um, we ran into, it turns out that the uh, the performance of our current environment and the Atlassian environment are about the same and the, uh, the time, effort, and money to move uh, didn't make sense at this time. Um, if you're interested in details, I've uh, I've actually written up the details on a confluence page or at least a high level details and happy to answer questions about that. So we're going to stay on our current environment. Um, let's see, uh, Sakai 11.5, there's been discussion on the core team whether or not we should have an 11.5 release. Um, part of it is uh, connected with Sakai 12 and not wanting to take resources away from Sakai 12, but also whether it's needed. So I'll be sending that. Uh, um, that information out on the list to just get a discussion going on is 11.5 needed and are the resources in the community that want to help push that forward and if it's not needed that that's fine too um, and we can discuss what that means. Um, Sakai 12 we're ramping up uh, QA thank you for taking notes by the way and could still use more help and there'll be more information on QA. There's already a Sakai 12 QA hub. So if you want to get, if you want to participate, you can jump right in and start doing that. Um, and we have our QA test fest tomorrow at uh, 10 a.m. Eastern. And before that at 9.30 a.m. we have an onboarding or general QA. So about quality assurance testing. So if you're just curious about it and want to know if you can help, how you could help, or just is this right for you, you can attend that. Um, and the way the structure of the uh, test, testing for 12 um, is happening, for those of us doing uh, more detailed testing uh, QA Maven role, um, we have primes for each of the tools. So let's say you wanted to test 
uh, the gradebook tool, you would look on our spreadsheet and we have that all documented, which is linked off our hub. I can put those links in if it will help. And uh, you would see NYU, Kyle Blythe has, is the prime coordinator for testing the gradebook. So you contact Kyle and find out what areas of gradebook need to be tested. And we have primes for SAMA Go testing quizzes and other tools as well. We still need some more volunteers for those prime positions, but we may have a good start. And assignments tool is still under construction. So that means that it's kind of hard for us to predict a schedule, although I think we'd still like to get at least an RCO on a release candidate out before the end of the year. Um, Sakai virtual conference is in two weeks. I don't think Wilma's on here right now. So I don't know she. Or I'll ask her. Oh, she is. Oh, Wilma, do you want to say anything about the Sakai virtual conference? Sure. Um... We, uh, we have about two weeks until the conference. So if you haven't registered yet, there's still plenty of time to get registered. And we've got a really great program this year. There's a lot of really interesting sessions and we're doing some fun stuff like uh, the trivia contest again this year. And we're also doing virtual karaoke during lunch. So that should be an interesting experiment. Um, and we've got prizes and stuff that will be um, randomly, you know, uh, raffling off at the end of the day so a lot of great stuff going on so if you haven't registered i highly recommend it and i will paste the um the link in the chat so you guys can get to it and view the um schedule and everything like that cool thanks you know i'll po post links to some of the stuff i'm talking about as well after i'm done with announcements and um I uh, want to also mention on a peri an Aperio level, there's a lightning talk scheduled for Monday, um, November 20th at, uh, is it 11 a.m. Eastern, I think? And uh, so, um, so that, and that has Xerti, OAE, Open Academic Environment, um, um, uh, uPortal and OpenCast. So a really great lineup for the next Aperio Farm Lightning Talks on November 20th. I think just sent that we just sent that announcement out over email. And uh, let's see. So and a whole bunch of other stuff's going on. <laughs> so that's I think enough for now probably. Unless anyone has additional questions. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Neil. And thanks, Wilma, for all those updates. It's always exciting to hear about all the different things going on in all the different parts of the community. Lots of really exciting stuff, QA testing, upcoming conferences, and lightning talks about potential new features, all good stuff. So I'll wait just a couple of seconds to see if anybody has any questions about any of those community announcements that they want to post in the chat. And otherwise, we will dive into our main presentation of the day. Okay, seeing none, I'll go ahead and hand the reins off to our main presenters of the day, uh, Sam Lee Pan from the University of Cape Town in South Africa, and also Alistair Hendricks from Tiger Bytes in South Africa are going to be talking to us about mobile apps in Sakai. So I see that Sam is sharing her screen now, and I can see that, Sam. So whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Sam, I can't hear you, so you may need to unmute your microphone. Oh, sorry, I had the the mic mute on my actual microphone on too. Um, thanks, Matt. Um, so I'm presenting from the University of Cape Town. Can you hear me? Um, we can so, hear you great. Okay, okay great. Um, so we are actually um, connecting remote. Well, I'm connecting remotely uh, because and this is a sidetrack before I jump into my presentation um, that there are student protests that have it's actually the third year that we've had student protests and essentially uh, the classes face to face lectures have been disrupted for for the, for the past few days. Um, so 
some people are going into the more um, online learning and um, blended learning approach. And if you're interested in hearing more about that or have any advice or tips, we're going to be at the Sakai Virtual Conference. And those are two of my colleagues, Shanali and Nicola, which are from the staff development and course and curriculum design clusters within our units. So I just wanted to mention that to start off with, and that's the University of Cape Town. Um, yeah. And OK, so today we are actually going to be talking about mobile apps and I'm going to be talking about UCT mobile and Vula side. So Vula is our Sakai um, instance that we've branded as Vula, which means open. I am Sam Lee Pan. I'm from the Learning Technologies team in the Center for Innovation, Learning and Teaching. So that's our unit. Um, I'm usually the quieter person in the room, so it's very strange to be uh, um, talking. And I'm sorry, I'm not looking at the chat. So if there's any messages, um, I think uh, hopefully Matt will be able to relay the, the questions at the end. Um, OK, uh, you can find these slides online. And let me tell you a bit more about Oh, the one thing I just wanted to mention is that UCT Mobile is the institutional app um, that we have worked on as the Vula team. But um, Alistair Hendricks, which is here today, and Ty, um, they're from Tiger Bytes, and they developed the Vula and Universe app, apps completely separately. So um, they, they're going to be present, well, they will be presenting on that separately. Um, but they'll follow on from this discussion. Okay, so why mobile apps? I've sent you this link. So if you can go to this link and maybe we can just repaste it in the chat. Let's see. Thanks, Matt. Um, so that that. So you should be able to go to that slide and you should be able to type your thoughts. Um, I'm expecting that most of you are interested in mobile apps being in this um, teaching and learning core. And can you type? Is there problems typing? OK, I see some people are typing. That's good. OK. So that's interesting. Um, so the drawbacks of uh, mobile apps might be that there's limited uh, functionality, that there's confusion over the desktop um, interface, and your problem is that you're going to be supporting multiple platforms. Um, and one of the reasons that people are looking at mobile apps is that they want push notifications, um, it's more viable for students that carry, okay, so it's more accessible, I think, essentially, where students have um, it available through the app. And the UI or the experience might be better through a mobile interface. Okay, it's an interesting drawback is that the the more teaching component for the instructor or your lecturer might be a bit more limited on your mobile. So, yeah, in cases of cheating. So there, in this discussion, it's just um, the beginning parts of us to develop and maintain. I'm going to leave that slide. I'm going to leave this this document editable. So if anyone, um, I'll probably make a backup copy for myself. But if anyone wants to um, add anything or edit or type that, you must welcome to go back to that, even if you're watching the recording later. Um, and essentially, let's see, yeah, resources and develop difficult to maintain. So that said, the the mobile app, well, the, the smartphone um, devices have been growing fairly exponentially in the last couple of years. So I saw this graph and I was actually quite surprised. We, but we don't even realize it. But I think more and more of us are just 
um, using smartf smartphones day to day. Um, in case you didn't write anything, I've also <laughs> written some notes, yeah. Um, so there's uh, one of the, this is actually based on the mailing list discussion that I, um, that I saw on Sakai user, which essentially is push notifications was one of the, the options and native functionality, for example, taking photos or videos of student created content. I've added some almost caveats there because there were some discussions that maybe progressive web apps would speak to some of these issues. Um, there's issues with currently uploading student content and where that is hosted. And um, so we just probably want to tease those out. I'm not probably the t most technical person to look at those, but there are definitely people in the community that understand a lot more of this and people probably in this room too. Um, and then the faster experience um, that could be, uh, but then it depends also on the web services and a created experience through the web services calendar grades. Yeah, I've, I've put most of the drawbacks more on the building, the supporting, maintaining and updating QA releasing. So more the software side, um, but definitely there's also those other user experience issues. Um, for example, a lecturer might not be able to do what exactly what they want to on a mobile app. Okay. So this brings me to UCT Mobile. Um, UCT Mobile, I have to add some, some caveats, uh, sorry, some, some disclaimers to start off with, that unfortunately UCT Mobile is not an open source solution. It was provided by a third party. And secondly, the Vula functionality is just a component of UCT Mobile. So the design might not be, um, the most, the best design per se, it was simplified for implementation, but I'll also show you some of the original mockups so you'll get an experience of that. Um, and this is really just to help uh, add to the discussions of mobile apps. Okay, so UCT Mobile is a third, institutional app that is hosted by a third party called Campus M. They're owned by Xlibris and uh, previously this was Ombiel. They were This app was developed through our central ICTS department um, in partnership with the communications and marketing department. So this started back in 2013 and it was actually released in 2014. So it has been on the go for a while. Um, so it essentially provides that convenience, ease of access for every, everyday um, UCT services. So just that central point. And I've just added a link there also if you're interested on in UCT on the article when it was released, putting UCT in your pocket. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, it has the main dashboard where you get your news updates and that's a rotating um, image essentially of um, latest news content linking to web linking to the web articles and um, it has integration with PeopleSoft so it has the timetable the fees the course results uh, and it also has PC lab availability and jammy shuttle schedules there's campus maps I think that's quite good because there are multiple campuses and lots of different buildings so that can be quite useful to um, new students or visitors and there's the library service the career service and then there's Vula uh, so I'll be talking more about that there's also links to social object uh, social pages such as um, sports clubs societies and postgraduate events and there's UCT Radio, which you can live stream from there, from their web page, and emergency contact details. So a lot of the content, a lot of the tiles, some of them have gone through the, gone through an integration or using web services, and some of them are just linking through to web content, pre-existing web content. So um, you can find more out more about this at that link at the bottom of the page, um, and you can also install or run it through your web browser and click guest login um, you 
yeah, you won't get all the functionality, but you would get a bit of the experience. Okay, so on the Vula side, our Sakai integration essentially, um, as far as I'm aware, this might have been the first Sakai integration that they've done with Campus M. Um, so the Center for Innovation in Learning and Teaching, um, Vula team worked with ICTS, Ombil developers, and Open Calab was also involved at one point. And essentially, we, um, our graphic designer, Rondine Carstens, did um, some of the mockups and designs. And I'll show you those. Uh, I'll just click this. So I did also link to this on the mailing list. But it's essentially the flow charts of how it would interact. We didn't implement all of these. Um, but this was um, some of the requirements that we were looking at. Um, and then once we had those designs, we started working, well, obviously this was also linked to knowing which endpoints were available. Um, so we just get those um, through Vula and the Campus M uses their own markup called AEK, essentially, which they use to help create the, the screens that the graphical screens that I'll show you now. So, this is the so when you click the Vula tile on this page, um, so you'd click Vula OVR and it would pop up like this. And this would be drawn from your, uh, sorry, that got cut off a bit, but essentially your, your announcement web services, and this would be drawn from your assignment web services. So we only went with the what's new, which is announcements and the upcoming coming up which is the assignments we deliberately excluded tests and quizzes for coming up we were discussing that and we thought it would be a good idea to include um tests and quizzes in online um, well on mobile um and then the last part of here which is my sites uh the last blue bar is essentially your all your sites so what it does is it redirects to your web login for Vula um, and it's logged in already and it wraps that web content. So you'll have your list um, of sites there. And then if you wanted to go back, you'd have your list of sites. You could always click this back icon so you wouldn't actually ever leave the, the app. So the gaps and issues that we encountered, the original design was going to include the list of sites um, uh, like native while well, using web services and pulling that in but we unfortunately found that was quite slow um, the performance issues of slowness could be related to also campus m we're not sure where this the servers are based outside of um well in europe so i don't know if that's also adding to some of that um, but essentially we did have to take away some of that integration and um we also were going so we were going to in this markup you'll see for web services where there was announcements or where there were resources we'd add something native and then if you clicked on any of the tools um, that did not have um, native uh, web services sorry have web services then it would go into uh, web content wrapped view. So we'd use the tool IDs and such to obtain that, um, those links. So the original design also included your calendar view, um, but we did, was, we did um, remove that or not include it. We were also concerned that some lecturers may not also be using the calendar very actively, but that said, if you provide the tool there, maybe they would use it more regularly. Um, and I said we didn't include Samigo. There's still some performance issues. Um, so I think that that is one of our tasks that we do need to look at, at really increasing it because it would be better to have a faster experience. 
Um, and I think the issue was with the functionality and balancing the functionality, the performance and the time and technical infrastructure. I'm sure there's a much better framework to look at. This is my concept of, in my head, what we're trying to do. Um, and essentially, it was trying to find that balance, which sometimes we obtained and sometimes we had to remove functionality for others time for other um, aspects. Okay. Um, the, so essentially, this is the stats on the UCT mobile front, and you'll see that almost or over a quarter of the activity seems to go through to the Vula tile, so it is very popular. Um, the Jammy Shuttle is just behind it, and timetables, and this is averaged over the last four years. I've just taken some stats for the last, I think it was eight weeks. So it was the start of semester um, around here. And then this was our, our mid-semester break. Um, you can see there's about 3,000 clicks on the Vula tab. I don't know if that's that much. That said, there are the other apps that are running, um, such as the Vula app and the Universe app. And I think at this point, it's a good um, time to stop and hand over to Alistair, which is going to be talking about those apps. OK. Sorry, I couldn't take the questions during that, but I'm, I can deal with those. Um, we can I can respond to some of those just now. OK. That sounds great, Sam. Thanks very much. I'm going to go ahead and hand the presenter privileges over to Alistair. And Alistair, you should have those right now. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Sam uh, and Matt, uh, for inviting me to come to present. Uh, unfortunately, Ty can't be here today. Uh, he's stuck in some work. But uh, what I will try to do is uh, just fill you in from his side as much as possible. Uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, I, oh, my name is Alistair Hendricks. I am a mobile engineer by profession. Uh, I studied at the University of Cape Town from uh, 2012 to mid 2015, and I currently work as a mobile engineer at Superbless.com, which is a fashion e-commerce company in South Africa. Uh, in 2012, Ty and myself uh, decided to take on the challenge of building a sick mobile Sakai experience uh, for the UCT uh, instance Vula. Um, Ty originally built his Android app in uh, 2013, uh, end of 2012, beginning of 2013, and launched that. Uh, I followed suit with an iOS app for Vula. Uh, and launched that in September 2013. Uh, just to touch on what Sam said, it was uh, it was very similar to uh, how UCT Mobile uh, uses it. We uh, used uh, scraped and stripped mobile frames for most of the uh, views. And those that are uh, familiar with that, they know that those you get those PDA views if you're uh, on mobile. Uh, and we scraped down all the sites um, from the mobile view and put that into a native app on Android and iOS. Uh, the user reception was good. Uh, I think on our first day of the iOS, of the iOS app, we had 600 downloads. Uh, and all in all, we had uh, on iOS, uh, we had about 11,000 downloads between 2013 and 2015 with around 600 to 1,000 users a day over Android and iOS um, just at uh, the University of Cape Town. The one, uh, some of the issues that we did uh, run into though in our first uh, iteration of this was the mobile experience and uh, somehow hacking that together uh, with Sakai. So uh, we had session expiries that we would need to deal with uh, when the user was interacting, make sure that they still have an active session. Uh, and that, that did become a bit tedious. So just to give you a sense of what we, what we did finally uh, produce, this is the iOS app um, of 
uh, the Vula iOS app, uh, which we will launch, which we launched. Uh, on the left, we just had all your sites. In the middle, we showed the web view with the stripped down frame. And on the right, we would uh, have the site tools available. So in 2015, I decided to uh, pursue and try uh, get a Sakai mobile experience working um, across the board. And I decided to pursue that full time uh, with some funding from a bank here in South Africa. Um, Stephen Marquard was uh, gracious enough to point us in the direction of the uh, Sakai forward slash direct endpoint, which really, really helped us a lot uh, in terms of getting a RESTful API back from Sakai. Um, I went into this uh, looking to try and make it as generic enough to be deployed and integrated uh, at any universities running Sakai 10. Uh, I named the app Universe, um, and we actually made it a new app. Uh, Ty wanted to stick with uh, just UCT at the time. Um, so he, he stayed with the Vula app at UCT and later released the Vula app um, for iOS as well, uh, or re-released that one. And I moved to create a mobile app that can work at any Sakai university. Um, any Sakai installation called Universe. Uh, cha that change did uh, pose some growth problems at UCT because you are dropping the name. Uh, and for some users, it was quite confusing. I can uh, say that Vula is still the preferred app at UCT just due to the name. When students are looking for an app, they're most likely going to uh, search the app that they're familiar with, the name that they're familiar with. Uh, we most I mostly try to leverage uh, the direct endpoint as much as possible uh, with resources, announcements, um, polls, and where where we couldn't provide a, a native implementation, we fall back down onto a strip web view. Uh, that did cause its own problems. Uh, when you do that, uh, the direct uh, restful. Uh, session and the portal sessions on shared. Uh, I think there's a Jira from 2015 on this, but I think it, that that is how it's intended to work. Um, also, in terms of getting this out to universities, uh, students were really uh, thrilled about having this um, about having this functionality, but engaging university administration um, and learning. Uh, departments was quite difficult, uh, especially I think a lot of the time uh, learning departments are very uh, keen to go forward with this, but there is usually an IT aspect to it that needs uh, approval from an IT department, which was always uh, very difficult. Uh, testing was also a black, spot, black box without uh, university involvement. And it was also, at the time, I was working on funding from uh, a bank, but we, we needed to somehow pay the costs at the end of the day of the development uh, of the team building that. So getting, on, uh, getting universities on board to pay at that point in time in that climate uh, and also showing that mobile is the way forward, uh, 2014, 2015, was quite difficult. Uh, we also explored uh, running ads, and at some universities, uh, IT departments were would say, "Listen, we love your app, but we unfortunately don't have budget for this, and or we can't allow you to run ads um, even on the private uh, app." And we, to some extent, uh, acknowledged that and went forward with their request and didn't show ads. Uh, at those universities that didn't agree with that. Uh, at we In South Africa, we unofficially rolled out to the following universities, uh, the University of Cape Town, the University of the Northwest, uh, University of the Witwatersrand, uh, the University of South Africa, which uh, has, I think, roughly 200,000 uh, remote students, um, and that has been uh, one of the big pickups uh, 
for our apps that uh, students at the University of South Africa are using it, as well as the University of Western Cape. Universe was released for iOS uh, and Android. I've recently uh, deprecated the Android uh, app as Ty's app, the Vula app, has now also included these uh, new universities. Uh, and he's offering a much better experience on Android. Uh, so there was really no reason to uh, keep that uh, maintenance up. And I, and I can uh, admit that maintenance and those development costs are a big thing when building a mobile app. So this is uh, just some screenshots of how Universe uh, looked. And this was really like the, was our, my second try after the Vula app. Uh, we, had a native, uh, a native announcement page where we'd render the uh, announcement HTML uh, as well if there were any attachments. We provided a native course, um, a native re resource section, as well as a native chat room section uh, where users could ask uh, questions. Uh, everything else fall, fall back onto WebView. Uh, so you would have seen the normal WebView um, just stripped from the header and footers um, if you were viewing something that we didn't support at the time, such as Calendar. Um, I personally moved away from developing um, Universe full-time at the beginning of 2016, um, and I looked to gain experience on other projects. Uh, we, we have a fair number of students at schools and universities still using the uh, universe. Uh, I think we do about five and a half thousand monthly active users, uh, which is a fair amount. Uh, and with that, Ty has provided a very useful alternative by allowing his um, Vula, Android, and iOS apps to uh, use a mobile experience. Uh, it's really yeah, an alternative mobile experience uh, if users uh, aren't enjoying uh, Universe. So yeah, where to now? Uh, I've spent the past about 10, 11 months uh, working on a Sakai iOS framework that's compatible with version 11 of Sakai. It's really a wrapper around uh, all the direct uh, networking logic and the the hassles of communicating with a Sakai instance. It's written in Swift 4. Uh, I'm hoping to provide UI elements too uh, in order to provide simple integration into existing apps uh, and a more curated user experience. I think uh, a lot of the time that's what uh, learners are actually uh, looking for. It's also been integration tested. so. Uh, the ideal solution is that universities would be able to just go onto a website, uh, provide some parameters, and Travis CI will int uh, integration test the framework against your uh, Sky instance. And you can see uh, which what sort of support you have uh, with that iOS Sakai instance. What that would allow you to do, and the framework would uh, ultimately allow you to do is uh, be able to integrate it into an existing app, uh, be it built in Objective-C or running in Swift 4. Uh, unfortunately, at this time, it's, it's really an experiment. Uh, it isn't open source. Uh, I'm playing around with the idea of bringing that out open source. Um, and to lead up uh, into that, uh, we, I am building a new uh, Universe app. Uh, it's currently unnamed, but it is in active development. It uses... Uh, the aforementioned uh, Sakai framework that I've built over the past year. We've used all the analytics events and the user journeys and sat down with uh, designers and uh, UX, uh, UI and UX designers to provide a simplified experience for learners. If uh, any schools or universities are interested in uh, getting that app or deploying that app at the university, we are busy working on providing an ingress API for uh, schools and universities to deliver push notifications for site announcements and hopefully to build off that uh, for uh, general announcements uh, that's possibly non-Sakai related. Uh, Alpha testing is going to be starting in December. If you are interested in your e-learning department, just taking part in an alpha 
testing or just taking it for a uh, test drive and seeing if this is something that could possibly work for you or you're interested in uh, just giving your two cents in what can or can't work, uh, please drop me an email uh, and I will put you onto a waiting list and get in touch with you. Uh, we plan to launch at the first tested universities uh, in February 2018. The app is opt-in from an institution point of view, so uh, we won't be operating that gray area of adding endpoints for universities that we haven't tested in order to provide a high standard of integration. Um, so yeah, just to show you what, uh, what the UI uh, is that we're busy implementing, which I've actually just started in the past week uh, implementing. Um, yeah, it's just a refreshed look uh, for iOS. We'll only be deploying this to iOS on iPhone and iPad. Um, and we're hoping that it will also up some competition or some um, some alternatives on Android too. And I'm sure um, Ty or uh, another student or someone here will be able to provide a great uh, Android experience as well. Uh, if you uh, have any ideas around, uh, around providing a mobile experience, uh, a better mobile experience, please reach out. Uh, I myself am keen to get back into the loop around what uh, future plans there are for modern uh, Sakai API, uh, what a modern Sakai API will look like. And um, I'm keen to hear ideas on how to better leverage existing API projects. I recall in 2014, 2015, there was a, a API proposal um, going around. Um, and we, we still need to work on the staff experience. I, I mean, we're uh, four years in, and we're still seeing limited uh, a limited opportunity of providing uh, staff a great mobile experience and lecturers. So if there are any ideas of how, about how we could do that, that would also be great. Um, and that's me. Thanks so much. If you do need to, uh, if you are interested in hearing more or just uh, signing up uh, for a, a mailing list, uh, please reach out to me. Uh, otherwise, you can also follow me on Twitter. Thanks. Thanks so much, Alistair, for adding your perspective and the context of your work to what Sam shared with us. This has been really a great presentation to see how you know, two different groups have tried to solve this problem of increasing mobile usage and how to make Sakai a solution for people trying to get more things done on their mobile devices. This has been really great. We've had a couple of questions here in the chat, and Sam has been very graciously answering some of those in the chat. Dave had asked some questions about you know what kind of activity within Vula is more frequent and whether they had been able to do any studies on what kind of things people were doing in the Vula app. And Sam responded that they haven't yet done any stats on specific services, but they could probably query the database and check. Alistair, I wondered if you had any stats or even any gut feelings about the kinds of things that you think students are doing more in the app or that users are doing more in the app? So yes, it's it's we do have analytics um, on, on our mobile apps. And mostly it's really, at the moment, the core is announcements as well as uh, resources. So uh, the use cases around there are students are on the go. They quickly need to access uh, announcement, an announcement where they got an email and they don't want to click through and log in uh, on the website. They'll quickly open the app and check uh, what's there. You also see a great deal of um, resource usage. Um, I know that uh, Ty has a offline um, a saved resource uh, area where you can save your resources. Uh, and when students aren't connected or if they're at home or in a dodgy Wi-Fi spot in the library, they'll uh, access that. And uh, at the moment, that's what I've seen uh, the analytics showing. Uh, there is also uh, the shuttle service, which is an ad benefit. Uh, in both apps, uh, as well as UCT Mobile, which is used quite a bit. So I'd say those are the top three. 
Dave also had a question about development time, which is obviously something that a lot of us are very interested in, just how long it takes to realize these projects because they are very intricate by nature and therefore there's going to be some time associated with them. Sam responded that even with embedded web content, it does take a long time. Uh, I think that coordinating with the different partners that they were using in the UCT mobile app, uh, for example, those who were not using Sakai also took time. Uh, Alistair, do you have any thoughts about that as well? Just some comments about the development time for projects like this. Sure. Um, initially, yeah, we took, I think, four months to build the first Vula app, uh, five months to build the second one. And uh, I wouldn't be able to give you an estimate on, on the third one now. Uh, but it is uh, in terms of in terms of the development time and working with multiple uh, partners, which I think uh, UCT Mobile had to do, that does slow things down uh, quite a bit. I think it, it was much easier for us. So I wouldn't say uh, use us as a yardstick to sit down and for an entire weekend just uh, get into the code uh, and uh, write up a few docs on how direct the direct endpoint work and pass that uh, to each other. But yeah, um, I would say that it is uh, just in general uh, in the app world that development time and those roadblocks between discussing uh, between integration partners does take up a lot of time. And the median time that I've seen in terms of uh, apps, uh, regardless of Sakai or not, is you're looking at about a lead time of four to six months for an app. Thanks, Alistair. That, uh, that gives a lot more perspective on the development time that's associated with a project like this, which is great for people like me who've never done a project like this and therefore need a little bit of context for something like that. Sam also comments in the chat that announcements and resources are quite commonly used in their courses, so she can confirm that that content is also being accessed frequently from Vula via the UCT mobile app. So that makes sense. I think that also seems to jive with the things that we hear when we get requests for an app like this here at my university, the University of Virginia where you know students want to get those kinds of notifications you know they they want to get those kinds of announcements on their device and they also want to be able to access things like required readings anywhere that they are and so i, I think that makes sense that those are the features that are being used the most uh, in the experiences that you all have had thus far any additional questions for sam and alistair feel free to post those in the chat or come on the mic I don't see any other questions in the chat at the moment. So again, thank you so much, Sam and Alistair, for taking some time to uh, share your thoughts uh, with us here. Uh, this has been incredibly valuable um, to those of us who don't have a lot of experience with the concept of mobile and Sakai. I think this has been really, really helpful. And thank you for your willingness uh, to allow us to reach out to you all and, and contact you uh, if you have any other questions. This has been really great. So thank you all again. And I know it was very interesting for me, Sam, so I'm sure uh, that it was very interesting for other folks as well. So we do have just a few more minutes here left in our meeting, and I know that we have at least one JIRA that a developer has brought to the TNL group's attention, and that JIRA is SAC 33536. Um, resources overwrite existing uh, should default to false for Dropbox uploads. So Neil, um, do you want to speak very briefly to this JIRA? Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, there's, If you see, there's a linked issue, which is uh, that there's a new feature that looks like it went into 11.4, uh, which I didn't, didn't realize, as well as into 12, to um, 
have an override existing files for users and the Dropbox tool, which by the way, another separate thing is you might want to discuss the naming of the Dropbox tool. There's been a lot of discussion about what it should be named going forward, but for 12, it's still going to be the Dropbox tool. Um, and, uh, oh, I guess that's in resources, right? So that's interesting because in content, I drag and drop. So I guess this, in resources, it's a new feature. And the default is that if you're uploading a new, do if you're uploading a document and an existing document exists with the same name, the default is to overwrite it. And then the question is, well, that's, this is a new feature and is this going to surprise people in an unpleasant way? Um, and especially for students. And I guess that feature was added also to the Dropbox. Uh, I was just a little confused right now because I'm noticing that in um, one JIRA, it mentions content and Dropbox, and the other one just the content area. Um, sure, the, there's two uh, JIRAs. The main JIRA that we're talking about is this one here. And the related JIRA, which was the new feature being added, is this one here. And so that's the question is what the, should the default, I believe, is what the de default should behavior should be um, for this feature. I think that's the question. Yeah. So I think that the default right now is that it does overwrite existing and for there's a concern, especially for students, you know, uploading um, their content that there's not like a version control thing, right? So if you upload a doc document, it just, um, it just overwrites it. Well, the warning, Terry, is that you have a check box in this, in the, I presume, in this. Uh, I haven't tested this feature, but I presume that's the warning, right? You're actively choosing to overwrite. So I don't think there's an additional, you know, are you sure you want to do this type of thing? I, but I haven't tested it. So I don't know if there's any any thoughts on that, how you think the default behavior should should work. Right. Sometimes you want to overwrite and it's a good thing, right? Because then it's not uh, then it's you yeah. Otherwise, it would have to, I think the way that the tool used to work or the resources tool used to work, it would rename the one that you were uploading. Is that right? so that you have now two copies, but one with a different name. Does this fulfill default.css using lesson Syria as well? Then no, I don't think so, Dave. I don't think it's related. I don't think it's related to lessons and default CSS. I think it's just, uh, I believe it's just for the content area and for um, Dropbox. I'm not sure how that area works. I assume that it that it, that overwrites. If you create a new CSS file, it would just overwrite it there. But that's a separate thing. So Terry, you're saying the default behavior. What version is the default behavior where uploading a new version just overwrites? Is that what version are you on? Um, yeah, you can certainly check it out on Nightly. I don't think there's any permissions. Let me take a look and see if there's any properties that need to be set <clears throat> to have that turned on. I think it's turned on. So um, resources. Let me take a look at the pull request just to see if anything's been updated in the default Sakai properties. But yeah, I think I think it works. Jump to, yeah, as far as I can tell, there's no property that needs to be turned on, so it should be on nightly. And it should also be on uh, the 11.4 version, I think, of Sakai, which is on the Q8 ILA, and certainly on the 12 versions. So I think it's on, uh, that feature is probably on just about every QA server on nightly. Uh, <clears throat> Hi, this is Charles from Illinois State. Um, I think we have an issue because resources and Dropbox 
pretty much work, work the same way and you don't might not necessarily want the same behavior in both those tools I think that's right. That's something I learned recently, Charles, uh, which I didn't know. That um, right, a lot of the settings that they're using, I guess, a similar code, uh, say the same, sharing a code base of some sort. It, it certainly looks that way because it they work seem to work the same way. And I could imagine that instructors that are putting documents in resources probably do want, if they're putting in a new version of something, they probably do want to overwrite the old document because they, then they don't have to change any links to that. <clears throat> but I can see the, the use case for Dropbox being a little bit different. And that would be good feedback too. I think uh, the core, I think the developers mentioned that as well. Uh, of course, that would be a lot more work, right? To, to somehow um, separate the two at some level so they can behave differently. <coughs> <coughs> so kind of the short term thing would be, um, what should the default behavior be? And then the longer term thing would be, yeah, should these these two tools um, have the ability to behave differently and what would that take to do? So Matt Burgess is saying he thinks that the default should be unchecked by default. So in both tools, Matt, on both resources and Dropbox? Well, I think so, Neil. I mean, it seems to me like what you would want is for the instructor to specifically enable that overwrite option if they want to use it, um, but that if they want to use it, that they would then have to activate that option. It just seems to me off the top of my head that that's the best way to avoid a situation where things are inadvertently overwritten. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, but uh, you know, so I would encourage you to put that comment on, and anyone else who has comments on, uh, on it, please put those comments on the on the Jira, because that's how we keep track. Of, that's how the developers keep track of those things. So it's good to have the discussion, and I think that make everything everyone's saying makes sense. Um, and you're welcome to test it out first. Yeah, Dave, I think it is available in resources. That's that's the original place it was developed as a feature. Yeah, we need to work on a, a global um, a global setting. Do no evil. Uh, which is off by default or on by default, right? Do no evil. So maybe uh, it would either be do evil and have it off by default or do no evil, have it on by default system wide. <laughs> we do have a small number of instructors at UVA who seem to like to do evil. So I would love a setting like that. That would be great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we can, you know, I think that could be a farm project. <laughs> I love it. Uh, Speaking of which, I just want to put a pitch in before I forget, as we still could use one or two more people um, for the uh, Aperio, Open Imperio Conference planning, just because I forgot to mention that. That was kind of an important one earlier. So anyway, back to this. But if you're thinking about really wanting to make a big contribution, being on the planning team is a huge, huge help to the community. Um, back to this. Um, right next to the any key. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So that's it. So uh, thank you all for looking at that. Like I said, I really encourage you to actually put comments on the JIRA. And if you agree with each other, you know, then then you put a comment saying, I agree with Matt Burgess, if Matt puts a comment on. And if you suggest that the two tools work differently, put that comment on, you know, so, so that's a really, really good way for the community to keep track of, um, you know, what the, what the consensus is in the community. And if you think that the default should be off, put that in there and so forth. So thank you all for, for listening and you know, comment away, please. Awesome, thanks Neil for taking a few minutes to bring that to our attention and walking us through it. This is an interesting feature and now we'll be able to kind of dive in and research that and give some opinions about it. So thanks again. Cool. We are right at the end of our time here. Uh, just one more note that I want to mention uh, that Sam very helpfully put in the chat uh, that Miguel is going to be leading a BOF uh, that I presume is going to be about Sakai and mobile solutions as part of the Sakai virtual conference. And she wanted to make sure 
uh, that people were aware of that. So be sure to check that out on the virtual conference schedule if you haven't already, because that will definitely be a great session and will probably be something that will build on some of the ideas we've talked about here today. Just a couple of notes on upcoming meetings. Remember that there will be no meeting two weeks from today. There will be no meeting on Wednesday, November the 15th due to Sakai Virtual Conference, which will be meeting the day before on Tuesday, November 14th. So no meeting on Wednesday, November 15th. We still have some openings for presentations in December. So we still have openings for presentations on December 6th or December the 20th. December the 20th may be canceled due to its proximity to Christmas, but we'll just have to see uh, what everyone's schedules look like. So if you have ideas or suggestions for presentations in December or beyond, please feel free to email those to us. Uh, we're always interested in hearing about new possibilities for presentations from the community and beyond. Uh, so feel free to email suggestions about presentations to myself or to Neil or to Tricia. So again, thanks very much to our presenters, Sam and Alistair. This was a great presentation and thanks to everybody for attending. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and we'll see you all in December. Thanks again.